remote viewing is probably one of the best ways possible to find out about the UFO phenomenon. So much of it is shrouded in secrecy. You can look at things like where who you were before this life. You can look at past lives. You can look at the beginning of the universe. You can look at the end of the universe. It doesn't matter what the question is. Remote viewing allows you to find an answer. Have you ever been able to remote view God? Yes, I have given out God many a time. And what remote viewers get and what I have gotten is that... Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Shifting Dimensions podcast. I'm your host, Jumi Moses, and thank you so much for tuning in back to the show. I have the pleasure of speaking with Birdie Jaworski today. You guys might be familiar with Birdie because she's been on the show before. And just a quick background on Birdie. Birdie is a famous remote viewer that left the public eye 22 years ago because of harassment. Her original name is Prudence Calaris. She was one of the first civilian remote viewers that ran the very first and still to date most successful remote viewing consultancy. Birdie has recently come out of hiding and has relaunched her remote viewing practice. Birdie is also the founder of Albuquerque UFO UAP Explorations. And today we're going to take a deep dive into Birdie's journey as a remote viewer, the mechanics of remote viewing, and recent UFO sightings and the current push for disclosure. Birdie, welcome back to Shifting Dimensions. It's such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Oh, I am so excited to be here, Jeremy. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me back on. Oh my gosh. I am I think I'm more excited than you because I have a million questions. And the last time you were on the podcast, we barely scratched the surface in terms of your experience and how deep your work is in the space of the UFO and UAP world, um, especially since you had to go into hiding as a remote viewer. Like how cool is that? But I'm sure it, it it's cool hearing it, but I'm sure living it must have been a little frightening for you having to go into hiding. Um, but before we even get into all of that stuff, I want to start off by talking about the Global Disclosure Day conference that you recently hosted on October 20th. So what exactly is Global Disclosure Day and why was it important to host this conference? Global Disclosure Day was held on October 20th this year, and it's a lot like Earth Day. It's going, this, this was our first one, and we're going to hold one every year, just like Earth Day, to bring the world's attention to the what's going on in the world of UFO disclosure. And the idea for Global Disclosure Day came out of a series of conversations that I had with um, a small handful of people at the New Paradigm Institute. And that is an organization, nonprofit in Washington, D.C., that is working with Congress, with your congressional leaders, your senators, and your House representatives to inform them about the UFO phenomenon and to push for disclosure. In fact, on November 13th, coming up soon, there is going to be a hearing in the Senate, a public hearing, and, uh, in, and in the House, they're going to be discussing UFOs uh, in our halls of Congress, and they're having whistleblowers and all kinds of eyewitnesses and people that have worked on secret UFO pro uh, programs for the government and for defense contractors come and present their evidence to Congress. And with the hope that eventually we'll get to the point where the president, whoever it's going to be, comes out and says, we are not alone. So Global Disclosure Day, what we did was we invited some of the absolutely biggest names in the whole world of UFOs, people like Daniel Sheehan, very famous civil rights attorney. He was lead attorney on the Karen Silkwood case, Pentagon Papers case, Iran Contra, number of other cases, super famous guy, and he is now pushing for UFO disclosure, and he is the head of the New Paradigm Institute. He spoke. 
Lou Elizondo, who has been making the rounds. His book, Imminent, is, has been number one in the New York Times bestseller list recently. And he was the head of the government's UFO program, ATIP. He spoke at our Global Disclosure Day. We had uh, all kinds of super well-known ufologists, researchers, military guys, men and women in, in all these different areas come out and speak for a few min a minutes each about why disclosure is important. And then I was there too with my UFO group saying, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I caught your cameo. So why is disclosure important, right? So obviously I watched the recording. So I have a sense of why people say it's important, but I want you to break that down because a lot of times the argument people make is that, well, if we know that we're not alone and we actually get the government to admit to the fact that, oh, aliens exist, extraterrestrials exist, won't that cause mass hysteria? So so why is disclosure important and, and why are you guys pushing for it? Well, People, humanity has been describing this phenomenon going back to our very, very earliest memories. We have cave paintings that show things that look like UFOs and strange beings with huge eyes. We have so many reports going back to antiquity where, you know, there, there are even accounts in the Bible and the book, you know, Ezekiel in the wheels within wheels that sucked him up into the machinery and took him up to heaven. Uh, we have all kinds of accounts going back where we keep describing over and over and over again, the same kinds of phenomenon, ships in the sky, different language use throughout the ages, depending on what level of technology we, we as humanity have been at. And so we clearly haven't been alone. But we've been gaslit by our own government over especially the past 75 years, 80 years since the Roswell UFO incident into being called crazy. If you report something that you've seen, our airline pilots have been afraid of reporting craft that they see in the sky, because if they do, they'll be taken off duty. They'll be cautioned never to mention this again. Our military fighter pilots have had the same stigma attached to reporting anomalous phenomenon that they encounter. And so we've entered into this age now where something that was considered kind of more natural in our, er in our early ways of being and, and for like a lot of our uh, native and indigenous cultures has become something that we're afraid of even talking about. Just 20 years ago, if I told anyone I was interested in UFOs, they'd laugh at me. They would think I was crazy and a nut. The stigma is slowly going away, but it's still there a little bit. I, there are, I have got a neighbor a couple doors down just talking with him the other night and he thinks all this stuff is crazy. And I'm, and I keep telling him, listen, look, our Congress is talking about it. We have major people out there, scientists at the highest levels, military men and women who have raced fighter jets or who have, you know, been in the trenches that have seen and cataloged this information. I think it's important for us to know if we are alone. It's the biggest question that's ever faced humanity. Are we alone? Are we just the only things out there on this little blue dot swirling around the sun? I think it's important for us from a philosophical perspective, from a theological perspective, from a scientific perspective, there's the potential for us to start looking at this phenomenon um, through the eyes of our own scientists who have never been able to adequately examine this phenomenon. Everything's been shuttled away into secret government archives. It'd be great to get our most brilliant men and women working on answering all these questions. And we might be able to find some answers that can help us. I yes. think it's important. Yeah, there's a great point that was raised during the conference that I never thought of, even I've heard people talk about it, but for some reason, hearing it during the conference, kind of a light bulb went off in my head and they were just talking about the fact that the government 
is aware that we're not alone. And a lot of times they, or it, it seems that they might have in their possession, non-human technology and that they're trying to reverse engineer and understand and potentially the implications of that being, you know, mass destruction potentially for the human race, right? So the argument, what I understood was that if we, if there is disclosure, then there, there can be, that could lead to accountability as well. Can you talk about that? I just want to make sure I got that correct as well. You absolutely got that correct. That's 100% correct. We have had whistleblowers that have come forth and already spoken in front of Congress. Uh, David Grush is one example, and there have been a number of them, and they have brought forth these, it sounds incredible, but these claims that say that the government has had secret crash retrieval, meaning crashed UFOs, they've retrieved them, and they have been dissecting them and trying to figure out what makes them tick and how we can capitalize on that technology. And there is no accountability. Congress has no oversight over these special access programs. It's a big black budget. Money is thrown billions of dollars, trillions of dollars every year goes into these special access programs that Congress has no oversight over. So there is a huge question of accountability. And we, the people, have the right to know where our tax dollars are going and what is being done with, with this non-human technology. That's what they're calling it, non-human intelligence, non-human technology. They're calling the bodies that they're finding biologics. So it's super interesting. So on October 13th or 14th, I, TikTok was kind of in a frenzy about a crash landing that happened in Washington, D.C., very close to where I live. I don't know if you heard about that. I didn't hear it talked about during the conference. I, I didn't get a chance to finish it completely. I watched about two hours of it. So I, I want to know, did you guys discuss that during Disclosure Day? If not, have you heard about this uh, new development? Is there any source of truth to it? What's the extent of your knowledge on on this new development? Yeah, um, it was not discussed during Global Disclosure Day, but I did see um, some people talking about it online over social media, on uh, Reddit and on X, people were reporting uh, different kinds of things, but I don't know what the status of that of that particular case is. There have been a number of interesting recent cases and in, in recent uh, potential crash cases, a couple, you know, in a couple of different countries. Um, the one that you're speaking about, and then another one uh, that I recently heard about that happened somewhere near West Virginia. So it's kind of interesting that there seems to be an uptick. And that's one thing that scientists who, who study UFOs are reporting is that we are seeing more and more people reporting these things happening. There's like been an uptick in, um, in flyovers, in potential crashes and even encounters people are having. And what does that mean? It's kind of, kind of curious. Yes. And you yeah. know, to, to your earlier point about the fact that there was a time, a lot of us, we were gaslit. Right. If, if you right. had an experience and you try to report it, it's like, oh, that can't be true. And you're basically mocked. But I feel like the sightings are so prevalent now that it's just so obvious that something out of the ordinary, potentially interdimensional is happening and the masses are aware of it. The masses are getting in contact, no pun, pun intended, um, mm -hmm. you know, and having these sightings that it's just one of those situations where you can't really gaslit the public as much, which I think is, will work in the advantage of pushing the initiative towards disclosure, right? So very, very, very fascinating. All right, so I want to switch gears now and dive deep into the world of remote viewing and talk about your story and, and all of that good stuff. So starting with, what is remote viewing? I think a lot of people listening to this podcast probably know what it is, 
but I think it's always good to have a refresher. What is remote viewing? How did you get into it? And why did you have to go into hiding? <laughs> uh, remote viewing is my deep love and passion. In 1995, the U.S. government came out with the report where they disclosed a classified program called Stargate that they had spent over 20 million of taxpayer dollars in over 20 years where they spent all that time and money studying whether they could create psychic soldiers, soldiers that were psychic spies. What they did was they gathered a few natural psychics, a famous one named Ingo Swan being one of them. And these psychics helped the military figure out how to turn a regular soldier, just a regular grunt into a super psychic spy. And they came up with a series of protocols that they discovered literally anyone could learn and become psychic. Originally, what they would do is they would give these soldiers the literal coordinates, the latitude and longitude of a place that they wanted them to spy on. Usually it was uh, an adversarial country or situation. So they would be looking overseas and different countries or at different leaders that were causing the United States troubles. And these psychic soldiers were going through this particular strict protocols and were able to accurately describe and sketch out what was at that target site. They called that the target where they were sending these psychic soldiers. Now this program was declassified in 1995. At that time, all those soldiers they had worked with had reached retirement age and they were leaving the military. And I think the government felt that they had to keep a lid on what was happening. So they went ahead declassified it. And when they declassified it, they told the world that, yeah, it kind of works, but it didn't work well enough. So we're dumping the program. Of course, that wasn't exactly true. It worked great. And so what they did was they started a new, even more secret program. <laughs> but in the meantime, the public learned about what they called remote viewing, mean, meaning you could view anything from the comfort of your living room. You could be in your pajamas and you could be watching anybody anywhere on the whole planet. And I found out about it the day that they declassified it because one of these psychic soldiers was doing the news rounds. His name was Ed Dames, Major Ed Dames. And he spoke right right out of the television. I felt like he was speaking directly to me and he pointed to the screen and he said, anyone can learn this. Anyone can learn to be a psychic spy. And I thought, well, good Lord, I've got to learn this. I absolutely have to. And it ended up that I happened to be living in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. And Atlanta was where Ed Dames had just finished training his first civilian student, a professor of sociology at Emory University named Dr. Courtney Brown. And Dr. Brown was just about to start a school to teach anyone to remote view, learning these new skills that he learned from major dames. And so I called Dr. Brown up and his class that he was planning on holding was very expensive, over $3,500 for a week of training. And I didn't have $3,500. So I bargained because Dr. Brown did not have a website for his new institute. And I had taught myself how to build websites. This was of course the mid nineties, you know, when uh, websites were fairly new for the general public. And so we bartered. I created the first website for Courtney Brown's Institute, which was titled the Farsight Institute. And I took uh, one of his very first classes in remote viewing. So I became one of the first civilians trained in remote viewing. And it ended up that I had a natural talent in it. Everybody can learn, but it's like learning a musical instrument. Some people can pick up the clarinet and just play something. And some people are going to kind of squeak along playing Mary Had a Little Lamb for a while. But I was one of those first people. I just picked it up and was great. So 
I quickly moved up the ranks and became the vice president at Farsight. And I eventually left to start my own company, which I titled Transdimensional Systems. And I trained people all over the world. I trained thousands of people to remote view in the late 90s, early, uh, early 2000s. And I also started doing work for corporations, for law enforcement. I found missing people. We solve crimes. My team um, worked with hedge funds. We worked with all kinds of interesting people out there to solve any mystery or question that they had. And as, um, as we were becoming more popular, that's when the harassment started. And it really kind of came to a head around the time of 9-11, the big terror attack. And what had happened was in 1998, uh, at, my, at my particular uh, transdimensional systems group, I had had my viewers looking at potential terror attacks in the United States as part of a project we were doing. And I remote viewed that too. And I happened to draw this sketch that uh, showed the Statue of Liberty, two tall towers, and, and two airplanes flying into the towers. This was in 1998. And in, uh, when 9-11 happened, people remembered that I had drawn that and talked about it years before and kind of all hell broke loose. I was on so many different news shows. I was on the Learning Channel, CBS Sunday Morning. I was in the New York Post. I was in um, the London Sunday Times, you name it. They came and interviewed me. Some of these organizations even sent people to take my training class and they were blown away. They could learn it too. And that's when the harassment started. I started seeing white vans, unmarked vans with the black windows parked in front of my home. People were leaving me horrific messages, threatening uh, to kill me, threatening sexual assault, threatening to harm my children. I had young children at the time. And after a while, I got terrified and I decided it wasn't worth it. So I stepped away from remote viewing. I shut everything down overnight. The harassment got so deep and so scary. I just shut it all down. And that was 22 years ago. And I started just doing all kinds of other things, but I still kept remote viewing, never stopped, still did it twice a day, just like vitamins. <laughs> and now I'm back. I feel like it's a different world now. It's a, a different world. And I feel people are more open to this and so far so good. I haven't been harassed yet, but I'm having a blast getting back into teaching and back into doing operational work. So I'm having a wonderful time. Wow, what you just explained kind of sounds like a, a movie, honestly. Just <laughs> first of all, what was the issue they had with you? Were they upset that you had disclosed the 9-11 attacks years before it happened? So who exactly was harassing you? Was it the government? Was it people affected by 9-11? Why were they coming after you? because of the prediction that you made based on your remote viewing? Yeah, it, it wasn't the nature of the prediction itself. It was because the military method of remote viewing, it's called CRV, which stands for controlled remote viewing or coordinate remote viewing. It's kind of interchangeable. I had decided that that method was very limiting and that it was very militaristic and kind of patriarchal. So I started deconstructing it and I came up with my own method. It was loosely based on the military method, but it was a little more open and easier for women, especially to, to get into. And they didn't like that. And, and so the harassment came from two different factors. Some of them, some of the harassment came from some of the ex-military remote viewers. Some of the harassment came from um, what I would call kind of black ops government types. Those are the unmarked vans and things like that. And so it was really that it had a lot to do with the fact that I was a woman 
had a lot to do because at that time it was almost 90, 99% men in, in the field. Also had to do with the fact that I was teaching so many people around the world to do this amazing thing. And I think that especially in some circles, perhaps government circles, that is very scary when you hand the citizenry the opportunity to figure out anything. Some of the things that I would send out to my viewers were things like, what is the biggest secret in the world? Or, you know, we were looking at all kinds of crazy things that were big secrets that we weren't supposed to be able to know, and we could find them out. And that was terrifying to people who are secret keepers. And I think that that was really the basis of most of the harassment that, and they didn't like that I was changing things up. So, so when you talk about astral projection, I just want to make sure I fully understand, right? Because sorry, not astral projection, remote viewing. <laughs> I just want to make sure I fully understand, right? Because to the point that I just made with saying astral projection, yeah. I've heard of astral projection before. I've heard of remote viewing before. Sometimes they sound similar to me. You talked about seeing the 9-11 attacks in 1998, but that happened in 2001, right? So somebody could say, did you remote view into the future? So is remote viewing a projection of your consciousness? It's a psychic ability. We know that you've made that clear how exactly does it work? And I know it's going to be hard to describe, but like you said, I could be sitting here right now and remote view something else, right? Am I, is my soul leaving my body so I can do that? Am I projecting my consciousness? What exactly am I doing? Okay. So everybody has had these moments where they felt they were walking down the street, say, and they felt someone staring at them. So they turn around. I mean, I think you've probably had this happen. I've had this happen. And sure enough, someone's staring at you. Or maybe during the day, you think about one of your friends who you haven't thought about in a while. And 10 minutes later, the phone rings and it's that friend, even though you haven't spoken with them in months or years. We all have these moments of awareness where our minds are just open so that we can hear and understand what is happening around us. And that's kind of how remote viewing is like, nobody understands the actual, I mean, there's no scientific understanding yet for consciousness itself. And so this is kind of a mystery, but in remote viewing, it sometimes it feels like you're projecting your mind somewhere. But most of the time to me, it feels like I am already connected to everything. Every time, every place I can remote view deep in the past. I can look at the time when the pyramids were being built. I can look at anything happening today. I can look at the future, the winner of the upcoming presidential election. I can look at the far future and you can access absolutely anything, but it feels gentle and calm. It's interesting. You're opening this aperture and you're able to describe and see, and it's not just seeing people think because the term viewing, it's like watching a movie. It's not like that. There's different kinds of remote viewers. Some are very visual and they close their eyes and they do see, um, shapes and, um, buildings or people, or, you know, bits and pieces of things that they're able to sketch out. Some are more conceptual and they know everything that's happening, even though they may not see a whole lot. And some are emotional where they really connect with the mind of a person or animal or being that's that, that they're looking at and they can hear their thoughts. Most people are kind of a combination of all three, but you have a strength in one of those areas. I'm a conceptual viewer. I kind of know everything that's going on. And I can, and the, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years now. So I, now I'm pretty visual. I can do everything, but it took, it takes a lot of practice. Anyone can do this. Um, it is in some ways, you know, all of these things like astral projection or people that do psychic readings or, um, 
you know, the work done at the Monroe Institute. I mean, all of these different kinds of practices are related. I think it's the same, similar kind of thing. They're on a continuum, a little bit different from each other. You don't leave your body in remote viewing, like astral projection. You're fully in your body, but you have this experience, this beautiful experience. And sometimes you experience what they call bilocation, where you're in the middle of your remote viewing session and you feel so fully that you're there that it can really freak a person out. You can feel um, like I, at one time, this was some years ago, I had a student and he was having a hard time with it. Sometimes some guys are so left-brained that they have a hard time letting their intuitive creative side out for this. And so he was struggling learning. And so I thought, well, I'm going to give him something that's going to knock his socks off. And I gave him a world war two uh, situation, the bombing of the fire bombing of Dresden, which was a really horrible, horrible thing that happened during world war two, where, um, where the, the bombing created these vortexes of fire and destroyed this, you know, this old city with all of all of these people. It was a terrible, terrible event. So I gave that to him. <laughs> he literally in the middle of it got up screaming and started running around in circles and ran out the door screaming that he was on fire because he felt it so strongly. And just a couple of weeks ago, I taught a five-day class in remote viewing. And I had a young man in the class who, um, I had not realized had spent a considerable amount of time in Japan and I gave out to the class and these are all done blind. You don't know where you're going, you know, that your teacher knows, but you don't know so that you can evaluate whether, you know, you're, that you're not making it up. And so I gave them blind the Fukushima nuclear uh, reactor meltdown that happened after the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Well, he started just, he started bawling in the middle of it because he had sketched out this amazing drawing with a, with a man wearing a suit. I mean, a, like a uniform type suit in a, in a control room. And he was trying to shut down the nuclear, the nuclear site. And he knew he was going to die. He was making the sacrifice, which some of the people did at Fukushima. They had to make that decision that they were going to stay and shut it down to save, to save the rest of the world around them. This was one of those people he connected with and he just lost it and he had to go outside too. So by location is another thing that can happen in remote viewing. <laughs> so just to make sure I fully understand, by location is feeling so immersed in whatever you're remote viewing. So if someone was remote viewing into my apartment, they'd be able to feel how I feel in my apartment. They would really feel like they were in the apartment. They would feel all my emotions feel the atmosphere of the place and they would essentially and essentially take that on correct is is that the yes. best way okay they would smell everything in your apartment if you were making spaghetti they would smell the spaghetti they would feel how cool or warm it is in your apartment they they would it's very it's a deep sensory practice so it's not just seeing but it's smelling tasting touching it's all it's everything and you said that <clears throat> and you said that some people are stronger in some of those senses than others, but everybody has a mi mix. So it's conceptual, emotional, um, or and visual. visual and visual. Right. Cause every time remote viewing is depicted on television, it's typically the visual aspect of remote viewing. So it can be conceptual and emotional. And with those two, is it that you're not really seeing an image, but you can sense that you're where you need to be and you're feeling the emotions or you understand what's going on, but you can't really see or make out any images? Yes, exactly. Some people have a hard time making out the images, but they know everything. They will, they will be working on their session and they will say, there's a man here and he is doing this and they will know everything that's happening. They'll even be able to tell the smells and the tastes and they can, they can describe all the structures there. They just won't literally see it. So it's yeah. really, you know, we're all so different that way. And it makes sense. So do you receive yeah. coordinates? Cause another thing, whenever I think of remote viewing, I think about how it's depicted on television and they're like, it's, 
one five three north <laughs> degree or something, right? They give people location coordinates and they focus on those coordinates in order to remote view. But it sounds like there's a mix with it. You don't do you always need a location? Or can you just say, like, I want to see what President Biden is doing doing right now? You don't know if he's in the White House or not. And then you can kind of project or remote view into wherever Biden is just by knowing his name. OK, so what the government found out back during the Stargate program, they started by using the actual latitude, longitude coordinates. And after they did some tests they discovered they didn't need those coordinates at all. So they started assigning just random numbers to the targets. And they would say that they wanted the soldier to remote view, I don't know, we'll say Saddam Hussein, you know, on such and such a date. And then they would assign a random number, like six, seven, eight, nine, just a random number. And they would give that soldier just the number the sol the soldier wouldn't know anything he would just be given a number and then they would start their remote viewing session and then at the end they would have accurately described where saddam hussein was on that particular time and date and so that's how i do it now i just I, sometimes if i have a group of students and i want them to look at say the taj mahal i might get a cool picture of the taj mahal and i'll just write a random number on it and they only get the number. They don't know they're going to be remote viewing the Taj Mahal. It could be anything, anytime, anywhere. And if I wanted them to find out what President Biden was doing right now, I would write down on a piece of paper um, the location and activities of President Joe Biden on such and such a date and time. And then I would assign a random number and I would give them just the random number, the viewers, and they would accurately describe whatever President Biden is doing. It's amazing. And it's kind of funny because um, viewers tend to do better on things that have a high, um, have high emotional content. Like if I gave them a picture of a rock in the desert, <laughs> They might have a little more tough time describing that rock than they would describing something that's more interesting or emotional, like where our president is on a certain time and date. That's more exciting, I think, to your subconscious than things that are boring. So I always try to keep it fun. Of course. So I, I have two questions that popped into my mind. Yeah. I'm going to start with the second one first, even though I want you to answer that after, because how do you, you said anybody can learn this, right? And you don't necessarily leave your body when you're remote viewing. So how do you know, how can someone know that you're teaching that they're not making stuff up, that it's not their imagination? How can they verify the legitimacy of what they're picking up in their remote viewing session? But the the question I want you to start off with, or the what I want you to start off with is, so basically you talked about you don't necessarily need the longitude and latitude or coordinates of a location in order to remote view. You can just say you want to look at into this person on this day and see what they're doing. Okay. So when I hear that, I can think about that in terms of the past or the present. I want to go back to you remote viewing and seeing the 9-11 attacks. So was that accidental? Did you happen to accidentally remote view that? Did someone say what's happening in New York, 9-11, 2001? How did you get there? What was the prompt? Yeah, the prompt for that, um, my second in command, a wonderful remote viewer um, who has his own business now, his name's John Vivanco. He had written down the prompt, which was, the next terror attack uh, on the United States. And he, then he wrote a random number and he gave me just the number. So I, it could have been anything. It could have been an elephant in, in my mind or, um, you know, or a castle in Scotland or, <laughs> you know, anything. So I start with the number 
And I start, uh, when you start a remote viewing session, it's really interesting. So if I asked all your listeners in one half of a split second to draw water, boom, just like that, draw water, every single person out there would draw a quick wavy line. If I asked everyone out there to draw a mountain, boom, that fast, everybody would draw kind of an up and down slope that looks like a mountain. And we have this internal understanding of the world around us. Our subconscious understands all this stuff. So how you start a remote viewing session is using one of those little doodles like that. They're called ideograms. And so you would write down the random number. And at, when you get to the last number, boom, you let your hand just do a quick doodle. And that tells you something really big about what is there at the target. So if you drew a quick wavy line, then you know that there's water there. If you drew a flat line across, then you know that there's a flat surface or maybe a flat prairie, something that's flat and big. If you drew something with the right angle, then it means there's a structure of some sort, maybe a house, maybe a barn, maybe the Capitol building. If you draw a quick little loop-de-loop, looks like a little head. That means that there's a being of some sort, could be a human, could be a dog or a horse or an alien. So we have this internal language and that's how remote viewing starts. And your other question was about, um, uh, what was it? No <laughs> I worries. Lost the train here. No, 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 it's okay. I had asked how you got to see 9-11, which you just explained. Right. And then the other question was, how can you verify the legitimacy oh, right. of what you're seeing? Because what if you're just making it up, right? Right. Okay. So because remote viewing is done blind, you don't know where you're going. You can evaluate by comparing what the target is supposed to be to what you produce. So um, in one of the last classes that I taught, um, the target was the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton. And I had a picture of the couple there, you know, during the wedding ceremony. I write a random number on it and I gave my students just the random number, nothing else. And one woman drew a man and a woman getting married. She wrote wedding and then she wrote royal wedding. She drew the officiant. She drew the um, royal family and she labeled it royal family. It's amazing. I actually posted this on my Facebook, you know, showing the photo and then her big sketch that she did and it looked just like the photo. So, and then I reveal, then I say it when they're all done and I never say anything to anybody. I let them do their work. And at the end of the session, I say, okay, everyone's done. And then I pull the thing out of the envelope and I said, you guys just experienced the Royal wedding. Here's the picture. And they're all freaking out because over half of them named it the royal wedding. They knew where they were. So wow. Okay. That's, so that's how you know. <laughs> to make sure I understand. So they didn't see the picture. All they got no. was the number. That's and it. They they just got the random number that that's was right. assigned to the picture and where you wanted them to remote view to. And that's they right. kind of use that number to get to where you wanted them to get to. So are they meditating? That's like, that's what I'm really trying to understand. <laughs> right. Cause I, I, I really want to understand how someone can learn this and how just by looking at a number, you can project your consciousness or tap into some sort of interdimensional plane where you can look at the past, present and future. Right. So is it a meditation is it a quieting, which, you know, meditation is a quieting of the mind. Like how, how does it, how does it work? What is, what is the experience? How can you teach someone to do that? Yeah, and I'm sorry so, if I keep asking the question in so no, many different ways. I just really want to make sure that I can, I understand. No, I love it. This, I can talk about this 
for weeks on end and have. <laughs> and it's so confusing. It's so confusing until you sit down and do it. And no, nope, and the, the thing is, scientists still don't know exactly what happens. One thing they do know, because they have done, there have been a few studies done where they have done PET scans and functional um, MRI uh, exams to people's brains. Those are active brain scans. So you can see how much of the brain is activated. And usually, you know, normal day-to-day -day life, if people, if you were having these brain scans done, it would show what regions of your brain are active at any given moment. Like, you know, if you're eating or sleeping or crying or reading, you know, different parts of your brain are activated. When you're remote viewing, your entire brain is activated your entire brain it's really crazy it, it burns so many calories because of that and so people that do a lot of rem remote viewing they lose weight <laughs> it's <laughs> okay that's a great it's incentive true. to start okay i know right <laughs> <laughs> i have to keep eating i have to eat an awful lot because i do uh, i remote view all the time so I have to keep eating and keep eating to um, keep my weight up seriously. So, but, but nobody understands the actual, like what is actually happening when this happens? I mean, there's these theories that, that you're tapping into the Akashic records, perhaps, you know, there's theories that, um, you know, there's all kinds of theories. I tend to think, and what it feels like to me is that we're completely all connected. Everything is connected through some kind of consciousness field. And it's non-local, it's quantum, non-local. And so if all I have to do is open my awareness and I can access absolutely anything. Now, the, the little procedures that you go through, the protocols, um, the method that I use now is very intuitive and super fun. And a lot of people are calling it kind of the next level of remote viewing, what I developed in my secret years. Um, I call it mapping because I have students make these big, huge maps. We use huge, huge pieces of paper and I let them use crayons and markers and colored pencils, all kinds of art supplies, because I think that that really opens up that aperture even wider. And so, and the mapping allows them to make connections between things. The military method, you get maybe some good sketches, maybe some good description, but it was hard for the psychic soldiers and then for people that were trained after them to put a whole story together, you'd end up saying, oh, that's what it is. And then you'd look back and say, oh, I got this. I got that it was tall. I got that it was red, but you wouldn't know like the whole story. And so the system that I'm using today, which I call mapping, you can get the whole story. You can totally pull things together and make all these really cool connections. Um, I just, on Sunday, my students gave me the Tic Tac UFOs. It's a famous UFO case that happened in 2004. Commander Dave, David Fravor, this was in the front page of the New York Times in 2017. Um, these Navy fighter pilots were out doing maneuvers and they saw what they called a huge tic-tac. It was like 40 feet long and it had two little feet on the bottom. And the tic-tac was zooming so fast and making all these maneuvers that, that no human technology could possibly accomplish. And so my students gave this to me to view on this past Sunday. Of course, I did it blind. They didn't give me, they didn't tell me, I want you to do, to remote view the tic-tac UFO. They gave me the random numbers that they wrote down on a piece of paper. And I only had the random numbers and I described it perfectly. I knew exactly what was going on in about five minutes. And I also got all kinds of extra information that was super cool about the big mothership under the ocean and uh, what the Tic Tacs were up to. It was, it was a lot of fun. You just need the numbers and you can... Wow describe everything. You can go anywhere. Okay. You can go anywhere. Is there a code of conduct when it comes to, or a code of ethics when it comes to remote viewing, right? Because I've talked to quite a few spiritualists and psychics who say that you need permission in order to access someone's energy, someone's records, et cetera. Right. So I know that a lot of what you've been describing are public. There, These events are publicly widespread, wide known event, right? You're not necessarily 
you haven't talked about remote viewing one specific person who's just sitting at home. You know, we talked about the royal wedding that was broadcasted. So I understand that concept. But in general, is there a code of ethics or code of conduct that says you cannot just remote view anyone? Like if someone broke up and they want to see what their ex <laughs> partner is doing, I'm sure they can do that. But are there consequences to remote viewing and spying on on people? Like, I, again, that was very convoluted, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Oh, no, you, you explained it perfectly. And yes, absolutely. You are correct. I only give out public events, big, big events, big places and, you know, famous people. Uh, usually most of them are dead. Usually by the time I give them out, you know, like the assassination of JFK or things like that, big public events that are, are already deep in our psyche. But I think it's extraordinarily important that, that you should never, ever, ever remote view anybody without their consent, if they are not a huge public figure in the middle of a huge public event. Like I would not remote view, um, I mean, even though President Biden, we've been using him as an example, even though he is a very public figure and we know a lot about him, I would never remote view him doing something private, you know, like, uh, you know, in his bedroom or even eating a meal. Uh, I think that that crosses a boundary. So you should always ask for consent if you ever want to remote view something like that. Uh, one of the things that I do teach as part of this practice is using remote viewing to diagnose and even heal, heal physical, mental, and spiritual and emotional illnesses. And so there's a whole protocol for that that I developed. And it's very, very, very effective. But again, you have to have consent. And so uh, I'm actually um, teaching a, uh, giving a free lecture on that this Monday evening uh, that'll be available on my website for, for free for anyone to, to watch later. But um, so the remote diagnosis in healing is super effective, but you absolutely have to get permission first before you uh, view anyone's private life. I know that there are remote viewers out there who do remote view without getting permission. I know, and I know that it's tempting for a lot of people that take training and then they go home and it's, you gave such a great example. If you break up with somebody, you want to know what they're doing. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah, of course. I, but, I, and, you know, yeah. yeah. But I think that there is like a karmic, uh, we have a karmic responsibility and that there could be, you know, there's certainly going to be some kind of damage to your own, your own being in some way until you make amends if you do something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the whole idea of being able to remote view and kind of assess someone's health whether mentally emotionally or spiritually and potentially offer healing can you talk about that a little bit how does that work so if if you were remote viewing someone if someone gave you consent and said hey I don't know what's going on with me could you please remote view me and let me know what's going on in my body and then you remote view them and you find out that they have the flu what are you seeing to assess that in your remote viewing yeah so um the way that I train people to do medical diagnosis is I, we take, we either draw on a page an outline of the person's body, or you can, um, make a copy of like a medical diagram of the human body. This is, if you're working on a human, you can also do this on your pets, uh, or on any, any living creature. And so you have this outline of a person's body and you take your pen and you start probing it and probing. It means that you just press your pen into the page and you go around the person's body, every square inch of it, and you will feel your pen will get, have like a resistance and you will feel when you reach a spot where there is something wrong. And when you get to that spot, then you can do a quick sketch and draw out or write down what you're perceiving, your sensations, what it may feel like, look like, what's happening. 
And at the end, your diagram is covered with all kinds of stuff because most of us have all kinds of ailments going on. They say that every person has cancer somewhere in their body at any given moment in time, but usually your body just handles it. It's just, you know, part of life. But um, so, so you may get all kinds of things that aren't related to the specific matter at hand, but usually you get that much more strongly than all of the little niggling things, you know, that people can have like the, you know, arthritis or whatnot, but you end up getting like the major things that they've got a brain tumor or breast cancer or prostate cancer or, you know, broken arm. <laughs> so that that's how you do it. And what you do to help heal and, and, you know, you can't like fix, if somebody is missing an arm, you're not going to be able to help them grow a new arm, but you can help people help heal themselves by using your intention, sending them love, sending them the ability to heal themselves. Sometimes just that little nudge, that little psychic nudge is enough to get somebody to be able to, um, to start thinking more positively, which then helps them heal themselves. Because a lot of, you know, most of our ailments are a combination of the physical and the emotional and the mental and the spiritual. We have, you know, we're complicated critters and we oftentimes, uh, if you start on a negative spiral down, that's going to affect your health, your spiritual health, your physical health. So, you know, doing, helping somebody with positive intention can make a huge difference. Wow. Um, how much of your work is related to remote viewing UFOs? Oh, that's my favorite subject on the planet. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that, right? Because we started talking about disclosure and all that stuff. And I kind of wanted to level set a little bit and dive deeper into remote viewing in general. Now I kind of want to talk about it as it pertains to remote viewing extraterrestrials. What is that experience like? Do the same code of con conduct apply to them as well, where you have to ask for consent before you can remote view a specific being? So I'll stop there and, and let you talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, remote viewing is probably one of the best ways possible to find out about the UFO phenomenon. So much of it is shrouded in secrecy, partially because really the smallest part, partially because of uh, whatever's being kept from the public by the government or um, defense contractors, the powers that be, whatever you want to call them. But a lot of it is is kind of shrouded in secrecy because the phenomenon itself is a bit intractable it's hard to pin down you know these these ships can appear and disappear it seems to be on a whim and maybe they're interdimensional maybe they come from another planet maybe there's a combination of beings out there so remote viewing offers the opportunity to find out about these things now i have remote viewed so many different major UFO cases from Roswell to the big flyover in night over Washington DC in 1952, the Phoenix lights, you name it. I have remote viewed it and I've given it out to students. And one of the most interesting aspects of using remote viewing uh, in the UFO phenomenon is that many of these beings that, that, that come from some other place that are piloting these craft they're telepathic. That's people have reported that going way back. People receive telepathic communication from them. And when you remote view them, they are aware of you. And sometimes they remote view you back or they talk back to you and you can actually engage in some kind of a communication. I won't call it a conversation per se, because Oftentimes it can be very one-sided. They are way more telepathic than we are. They've developed more. I mean, perhaps not all species, but some of the more common species that we interact with on this planet, they can get into your head and they will give you messages. They will tell you, sometimes they'll tell you, Hey, leave us alone. Stop, get out of our heads. And when that happens, I will shut down a session. I'll say, okay, okay. And, um, so, so yeah, I love remote viewing and finding out as much as I can. So when you say they remote 
they they remote view us back. What does that mean, right? Because again, so for example, I I was watching a show recently. It was it's called Evil. It's not really that scary, but it's called Evil. I, I won't I go. Love to, that show. You love that? Show? Okay, perfect. I don't know if you've seen season four. Don't want to ruin My God, it. With remote viewing. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> I about fell over when I saw that. <laughs> yes. How accurate was it though? I, I mean, I'm no, sure no, the listeners no. might I be. Mean, you know, it's. There are some parts of it that are a little accurate. Some of the things that they did in the show, they had uh, they had somebody out in real life, like standing on a bridge and looking out at the city, the, the city skyline, and then the the um, the priest that was remote viewing, he was supposed to be seeing through that guy's eyes. Now that was an exercise that the military actually did do in the Stargate program. So they pulled, I think some of that from the original military program yeah what they were describing so you saw the i don't know if you remember the scenes where it it almost felt like he was able to enter someone's body as he was remote viewing them and the person could also access his body and kind of control him or he could control them is that accurate or is that an exaggeration That is a major exaggeration. It doesn't work like that at all, especially with humans. There's just no way you can get into someone's mind and understand what they are thinking. That's very common in remote viewing. So if you're looking at, um, like when princess Diana was killed in that car crash in the tunnel, and if you remote view that you can hear literally feel and hear her dying thoughts, things like that. You can, you know, you can get that kind of a sense what someone's thinking. Um, You can understand, you know, what they're thinking about their kids. You can even kind of ask questions on a consciousness level. You're not literally asking them questions, but you can find out different kinds of things, but with aliens way different. Now they can't take over your body when they're communicating with you, you can't take over their body, but you can have an exchange of information. Um, Oftentimes they will send you a message that is very complicated and isn't necessarily in English or any language. It's like a series of thoughts. and, And I like to call them thought balls. You know, it's a big ball of thoughts that you have to unravel and it can take a long time to unravel those kinds of thoughts. So aliens, they're, they're super interesting. Some remote viewers feel that it might be dangerous remote viewing them. I, in 30 years and remote viewing thousands of alien targets, I've never once felt that it was dangerous or had anything terrible happen to me, but some people are afraid of it. And I think that's okay too. People have to find what they're comfortable with. Of course. Is there a particular race or group of extraterrestrials that you're fond of, right? We know some of the popular ones in pop culture, the Greys, the Reptilians, the Lemurians. There's so many of them. But is there a particular group of extraterrestrials that you've kind of formed a relationship with that you you often remote view and speak with that is such a great 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 question uh yeah i have remote viewed all of the above and they're all interesting to me but the my favorite aliens (laughs) um have never actually visited earth one day i remote viewed uh somebody had given this to me as a blind target so i didn't know where i was going and what they had wanted me to remote view Uh, was the most advanced civilization in our galaxy. And uh, in that civilization has not visited us, but I had the most incredible remote viewing session that I've ever had. In fact, I'm getting goosebumps just remembering it. It was achingly beautiful. Their civilization was absolutely perfect. Everyone lived in, or lives, they're still, they're still going, lives in complete harmony. They have no hunger. They have figured out their energy and resource needs. They are travelers and they have their favorite places that they like to go off their planet, but they have just this beautiful society that is just full of equality and 
uh, growth and understanding. It's, it's like a, it's like they're all perfect in some kind of, I mean, nothing, I guess nothing's really that perfect, but they are way more perfect and more intelligent and more cool and interesting than, than we are. And so I have visited them multiple times and every time I go, they recognize me. Now they recognize me and they are always telling me, don't worry, you guys are going to get there. It'll take you a long time, but you will get there. That seems to be the message that they keep giving me, but I love, love, love them so much. They are just joyous, happy, wonderful people. Their music is so different than ours. Their food is so different and they seem to have a lot of joy in everything that they do. That's what do my they, favorite aliens. What do they look like? Yeah, they are. They are, um, by my estimation, this is just from remote viewing data. And so I have nothing to compare it. You know, I have no way to evaluate it, but I think I, I'm pretty sure I'm right. They are, they are, they are taller than we are. They are, um, they are, they do have two legs. They do have two arms, but they do look very different. Their necks are quite elongated. Um, and they have almost, almost like feathers, but not quite feathers, something between feathers and scales. It's soft uh, and shiny and very um, iridescent. They're very iridescent beings. They um, can shift. Um, they can shift into um, almost like light bodies. I'll say they can shift in and out of some kind of phase so that sometimes they are fully physical and sometimes they are not physical at all. And they do have companions that they, that they travel through life with. They are, they don't have, they don't have like a husband and wife or husband and husband or wife and wife. Like we have here, they seem to, to travel, to um, live together in very small groups. So they have like a, a group that lives together, raises children together. Um, they have big ears. That's the other thing that comes out, the big ears, which is kind of interesting. Um, they are very sweet and very intelligent, interesting people. Yeah. And I, yeah. do they have a, cause you know, sometimes when they depict extraterrestrials, they have like pink skin or oh, yeah. blue skin or green skin. Did you kind of see if they have what their skin tone might have looked like? Yeah. It's, it's iridescent. It reminds me of, um, Okay, so we have these little bees here in New Mexico, <laughs> these native bees called sweat bees, and they're kind of this metallic, uh, uh, iridescent green color, and they're kind of that color, like greenish, metallic-y, but super, like, like it shifts depending on the light, you know? They, it, it, yeah, it's well, they really interesting. They sound beautiful. They sound beautiful. They are. But... They're amazing. <laughs> I hope you get to meet them someday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a good way, not in a. I, I'm always kind of like, what would it be like to have alien contact in a way where I'm not just seeing a flying disc in the air, but yeah. uh, an an alien extraterrestrial like pops up into my house. You know what I mean? I don't know if I want that experience. I feel like I like to learn it from. I like to hear about people's experiences, but. If it, if that's part of my path to further awakening, then, you know, so be it. Who knows? Um, really quickly, because I'm going to ask some more in-depth, more philosophical questions. But before I even get there, you said that you, we just talked about these alien species. They've never come to Earth. And if, this is a question that people always ask. So the, the aliens that do visit Earth, why do they care? Like what, what is their vested interest here on earth? Have you, did you pick up any sort of pertinent information from all of your years remote viewing? Yes, they, some of them have been fully invested in humanity going back since the very early, the very earliest time that, that humans have appeared on this planet. They they have been um, perhaps even involved in our genetic design. There's a lot of evidence for that. And that does show up in remote viewing data that they have um, helped us 
in our evolution through manipulating DNA at different times. There was a time, you know, during the Sumerians is one time when they came down and they, and they, you know, the Sumerians talk about the Anunnaki that came and taught them that came from the sky. They showed them how to farm, how to, uh, raise animals and they manipulated their genetics at that time. And so there's, you know, there's different aliens that have been involved with humanity on that level. There are others that are simply just passing through. And there are um, some of those I've remote viewed and there are accounts of different kinds of unusual aliens that only pop up a couple of times in the literature. Those are just kind of your flybys. <laughs> and then we have some, you know, really interesting interesting situation with like the gray aliens, which were not as prevalent in our early, you know, humankind, but have come into some great prevalence in our modern age, modern nuclear age, seemingly around the time of Roswell and, and since, and those seem to be involved in some kind of, this is the whole abduction uh, accounts that people talk about where they see the aliens uh, coming into their bedroom and then they're carried up into a ship and procedures are done on them. And there seems to be, uh, it seems to be that there is a hybridization program going on where they're harvesting eggs and sperm from humans and creating, uh, mixing those with alien genetics and creating a hybrid alien human babies. A lot of women who have undergone abduction experiences have reported um, going up into ships and then being handled, handed an infant that isn't quite human, isn't quite alien, something in between and, and asked to cuddle it or to talk to it. Um, and so it's fascinating. That seems to be what the grays are interested in some kind of hybridization program for reasons. Um, it, I don't think that they want to take over the earth. I think that they're trying to heal their own society that they have discovered that they have gone down some paths that they can't recover from in term, in terms of like a too much reliance on technology and that they have, um, you know, lost a lot of their emotion and creativity core. And that's what they're trying to recapture. That's what the remote viewing data suggests. And then you have, you know, you have your mantids, your reptilians, <laughs> everybody seems to have a different agenda, which is kind of interesting. And we've had many visitors here and maybe someday we will be visitors on other planets and they'll wonder about us. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about the greys, I've heard so many people say is that they're actually from a different alternative timeline of Earth, that they're actually started off just like us human beings, and then evolved to what they are now. So in a sense, they're us, but from a different timeline in the future, in the far, far, far future, which again think about that that's like, like it's gonna blow your mind <laughs> but it, is that do you think that's true you know do you buy that that they're a version of us from a different timeline of earth I, I think I know that there are people that think that and I think that what they're picking up on is is something I think that it's something kind of similar but not that I don't think that they are human but I think that what they are is what we could become if we continue down a path that's dehumanizing. I mean, we are having now, we're kind of at this crossroads, this interesting crossroads right now, where we're, uh, we are looking at more and more advanced forms of technology, such as artificial intelligence. People are experimenting with transhumanism. We are giving more and more of our daily life over to machines. Uh, you know, if I look at, I have a 10 year old granddaughter, I love her so much. And I cannot believe how different my life at 10 years old was compared to how hers is today. Just the reliance on technology, the, um, there is no time for kids today to just sit and think and lay on the grass and look at the fireflies and the stars. They don't, nobody looks at the sky anymore. Everyone's looking at their phones. Even if I just, if I go for a walk in my neighborhood, people will be walking down the street and they're texting. And I think that we're losing something that is essential. And if we continue down this path and if we allow the machine world to take over, 
in ways that are unhealthy, I mean, you know, some technology is absolutely wonderful, but too much reliance on it, I think we'll start losing a, a, a big part of our, our center. And that could lead us on a path like the gray aliens. I think that they were much like us. I think that they're kind of a mirror of who we could become and uh, their past is maybe uh, akin to who we are today. I don't think it is us in the future, but it's like who we could be in the future, if that and makes you, sense. Yeah. And it also, you don't also think that they're us from a different timeline of earth. Cause that's also what people are, they're like, yeah, that's also something else people say that it's not this timeline, but a different timeline. Okay. I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> So let's get into the more esoteric part of this conversation, which I guess we've kind of been touching on. So I don't know if you're someone who reads the Bible or if you're religious at all, but something that religion tries to answer is how did we come into existence? Why are we here? And obviously a lot of religions have a savior. In Christianity, it's Jesus, right? So I know that you said at the very beginning that sometimes, you know, you created a protocol that was not as restrictive as the one originally created by the government to give you more freedom to explore the universe, right? So have you been able to, for example, remote view the time of Jesus to see what he actually looked like, to see what his life was like? Have you been able to remote view or can you remote view how we came into being, why we're here? Great questions and absolutely yes to both. And just to give everyone an idea of who, where I am spiritually, I grew up Catholic and very Catholic household. And today I kind of believe everything just through my own remote viewing experience. I've come to understand that there is deep and beautiful truth in, in just about every faith out there. It's incredible. Um, I have absolutely looked at many of the stories in the Bible, including the life of Jesus. Jesus was an incredible person. Every time I have given him out to, to students, they love, love, love him. They're very moved um, by his teachings, his actual presence. Uh, some, of, some of the students remote viewing Jesus have felt, have even felt that that he had maybe had had some kind of alien encounter that opened up, opened him up to be able to um, do his healings and to provide his teachings. And I think that that, that, that could be the case, quite honestly, he was extraordinary. Uh, if you look, go through history, there are some people that are simply extraordinary and he was absolutely one of them, no question. Um, you know, there's, there, there are others too. the Buddha, the Buddha is another example of somebody who was absolutely extraordinary as a human being. If you can, uh, I've given out the moment, uh, the Buddha's first moment of enlightenment. That's, you know, it is remote viewers who view that it changes you, changes you forever, because in that moment you are one with the Buddha and you experience that oneness with absolutely everything. And you're never the same after that moment in time. You can look at things like where, who you were before this life. You can look at past lives. You can look at the beginning of the universe. You can look at the end of the universe. It doesn't matter what the question is. Remote viewing allows you to find an answer. Sometimes the answer is a little hard to interpret, especially something that's extraordinarily esoteric, but you can get a description and a feeling, especially that feeling. And uh, you can keep exploring. Some of these questions are still hard to answer even through remote viewing, but they do give you a rope to tug on. You don't have to rely strictly on faith. You can rely on some data and faith okay so you sparked my curiosity when you said you can look at the beginning of the universe and the <laughs> end of the universe have you ever gone that deep like what's the deepest you've gone in terms of trying to get an understanding of this thing we call life this thing we call the universe yeah I think that um 
I have looked at the beginning of the universe and I've looked at the end of the universe and I've looked at everything in between, but I think that the most profound thing that I've looked at, and I tend to give it out to students quite often, new students, is the biggest secret in the world. I love this target. And I'll tell you why. It's because they always get the same things over and over. They get this idea that everything around us is in many ways inconsequential, that the most important thing and that our daily lives keep us from this. So it's the biggest secret is that to be happy, you need to let go, live in the moment, be kind to your fellow person. It's just, it's like the teachings of Jesus or the teachings of any mystic out there, but it's so profound when students view this because they understand this is the actual biggest secret in the world is that we're supposed to just be present and breathe and be kind to each other. It's amazing. I don't know. I just, for, to me, that's like the most profound thing that I've ever remote viewed is understanding that just being is enough. So the, yeah, there's just so many, so many questions and so yeah. many, and this <laughs> Keep is, going. <laughs> this, this is talked about in so many religions, so many spiritual practices, this idea of being present, loving, being kind, that's the ultimate, ultimate thing that everyone should yeah. work towards. But, you know, when we talk about the beginning of the universe, because I want to talk about the end as well, because I'm intrigued by that concept. But a lot of people will say the beginning of the universe started with God. Have you ever been able to remote view God? Yes, I have given out God many a time. And what remote viewers get and what I have gotten is that we are all God. You get this sense that every single one of us, that God is in us and that we are in God, that, that there is, it's like all of us combined and everything around us, that is God. It's everything. That's what everyone always gets. Wow. Okay. And then what about the end of the universe? What does that mean? Are you talking about the end of the physical universe or yes, the, the, okay. Yeah. Because our, our, you know, our universe, it's a physical place and someday it will cease to exist. Some scientists think that it's going to, you know, entropy will cause it to just slow down and cool down. And eventually it'll just, you know, die, die. And Actually, when um, I've remote viewed this and when others have remote viewed this that I've given it to, we get something really interesting. We get that our universe transforms into something else, that it shifts. We go through, and I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, but who knows, maybe it shifts into something else. And <laughs> I'm going to steal the name of your show. It shifts dimensions. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> and it like elevates itself. And then everything is transformed. That's what everybody gets when they look at the end of the universe. It's not an ending. It's a transformation. A shift. E energy can neither be created, created nor, destroyed. nor destroyed. So it just transforms and becomes another thing and starts again exactly fascinating okay so I have to ask the question though is there any sort of mental or conscious bias to what is remote viewed so for example sometimes when people have near-death experiences they will go up and because they believed in the Buddha they will see the Buddha because they believed in Jesus, they'll see Jesus. Because they believed in Muhammad, they'll see Muhammad, right? So they'll come back and be like, yeah, you know, this sick person is the real and true savior because I saw them during my near-death death experience. So I just want to know, is there a margin of error associated with potential cognitive biases that we might have based on how we grow up, how we grew up and so, certain the belief systems that have been already 
ingrained in us? Yes, to a degree, because when you remote view, you can't erase yourself from the equation. There is always going to be your own personal ideas and thoughts about what you remote view. Like if you, if you were going to remote view the winner of, of, you know, the next presidential election, well, people have really strong feelings on both sides of the aisle. And so say your preferred candidate is not the winner. You might describe the winner as somebody who's awful in many ways, because that that's your bias. That's what you think about that person when the reality may be a little more complicated than that, or maybe it's not, <laughs> but you know, so there's always going to be, um, your own feelings do get in. So if you really want to answer a question using remote viewing, it's always good to use multiple remote viewers and to compare data across that set. So if you get one person's results, then you compare it to say nine other per people's results. And then you can kind of get a more objective view of what that answer might be, because some people are going to have, you know, a more religious understanding of the world around them or a more philosophical understanding, or they're going to be more on the right side of the aisle or the left side of the aisle. All these things do come into play just like they do in the rest of life. That, that makes sense. I, I, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. So because you said that you can remote view God, you remote view the beginning and end of the universe. I'm also assuming that you can remote view what people consider to be heaven, different dimensions, right? Once people cross over. So could, if you, if someone lost a family member, could they remote view that person that has crossed over to the other side to a different dimension? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Really? And you can even have a conversation with that person in remote viewing. Um, they will, when somebody crosses over, it appears, it, at least this is what the remote viewing data it seems to indicate is that they they are still themselves but they're also different they they lose a lot of whatever these trappings are you know here on this planet and and they become their true true pure consciousness self out there in the whatever world that is that whole new existence and and who and those people are are, are are, are dead people out there, their consciousness, they can absolutely have a conversation with you if you reach out through remote viewing. And uh, sometimes the messages that people report are extraordinarily interesting and profound from those encounters. Um, and, and it's really interesting too, because sometimes um, sometimes people have, have remote viewed their, their um, you know, their loved one who's moved, moved on and they will get a message back that, you know, you don't need to be talking to me. You need to focus on your own life. You need to, to, to close this door. So sometimes that's the message that comes through. Which makes sense because I feel like then you're still holding on to that attachment that you have with that person. And that could potentially be incurring more karmic debt. I heard that from I, I was speaking to someone who's very entrenched in that work. So I don't know if it would incur karmic debt if the person had already crossed over, but it, it could get a little bit dicey when you you keep having interactions in different dimensions or astral realms. Do you ever mm -hmm. remote view lower astral realms? I mean, I don't see oh. why you would want to do that, but I, I'm <laughs> curious, do you ever do that to kind of get insight on and the nature of that? and their influence on earth? Yeah, I, I have, I have looked at that. Um, I don't give that out to students whatsoever, but, uh, but some of us have looked at those kinds of things and, and they can be unpleasant, but they're also extraordinarily educational because you discover, um, just how much of your own presence and consciousness and what you're doing in your own life, how much maybe you're giving it into, um, you know, your baser nature, it, it can be a real eye opener when you look at those kinds of things. Now, I don't think that, I think that, uh, in terms of those kinds of, um, entities or energies, um, yes, they can influence people on earth. Absolutely. It's usually people that are, um, in a bad place, 
you know? And so sometimes, um, the best thing you can do for people that are having that kind of a relationship with the dark side, I'll say is just to offer them as much love as possible. Um, but I don't think that that those kinds of um, things are causing any kind of lasting harm. I just think it's something that's always been a part of humanity, part of our journey, something that, that every single one of us has to wrestle with in some ways and some, you know, at different points in our life. And uh, that's hopefully the victory is that we understand how to move through that darkness. We all have to go through the underworld, right? To come up on the other side. There's, there's no spiritual journey without it. Absolutely not. And uh, so, yeah, I have looked at that. Yeah. And I keep going. To, I, Birdie, let me know if I'm asking way too many questions and if it's just getting ridiculous, just let me know. Um, no, are you kidding? There's, <laughs> this is remote viewing. <laughs> it is ridiculous in and of itself. <laughs> okay. I love it. So I, I know you said that when you remote viewed God, you kind of got the sense of God is in everything. We are part of God. There's no separation. So are the lower astrals also a part of God? Because I mean, I'm I'm asking this question, right, in the context of this whole notion of heaven and hell that people tend to talk about a lot, right? And how hell is this place that you go to, the devil oversees it. And then it begs the question, did God create the devil? And then when people say that everything is a part of God, is the devil a part? You know what I mean? So I don't know if you thought that deep about the question or if astro I mean remote viewing would have given you any answers but I'm still posing it just to see what you have to say <laughs> oh I grew up Catholic I've thought about that <laughs> but you know I do believe that it, and this is just from remote viewing and just my own life experiences that everything absolutely everything is connected the darkness and the light it's you know we are um we're not homogenous beings. We're more of an amalgamation, you know, with little pockets of light and little pockets of darkness. And I think that we are just, we're one with everything. I think it's all part of this beautiful reality. And that part of having this experience on this planet means that you have to accept that there's light and there's dark, and you have to make decisions about the kind of person you want to be and where you want to go and how you want to relate uh, with all of those different aspects. I don't think you can escape the darkness entirely on this planet. And I don't think if you want to chase the darkness, I don't think you can escape the light either. So I think that um, what remote viewing has taught me is that it really, everything really is all one, completely connected, everything together. I think that's what we call the divine or God and that it does reside in each of us. You know, I'm a piece of God, you're a piece of God. And I know sometimes I'm, I'm a crabby, cranky person and I probably could be nicer, but I'm still a piece of God, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Do you ever ask for protection when you're remote viewing? Is that something that you need? Because for example, if a UFO could remote well, I don't know if UFO is the right term, term here. If an extraterrestrial could remote view you as well, right? I, I don't know the extent of the implications. They can't take over your body, but I don't know if they could psychically or spiritually attack you. So is there some sort of protection or shield that you use before entering a remote viewing session? Um, uh, quite a few remote viewers do. They imagine that they're surrounded by white light or they might do a special protection meditation first or even use things like sage and other spiritual tools. And, and I've done that. I have done those kinds of things too, but I generally feel that those are mostly psychological tools to be honest. And I don't think that anything, I think because we are all connected with everything that nothing can harm us in, in that kind of psychic way. I think that if, if you are somebody who thinks that something can harm you, then you might have that experience because you're expecting it, but I don't expect it. And so in 30 years, I haven't had 
anything feel like it was attacking me or feel very negative. Now I have had aliens that said, Hey, back off bub. And I've backed off and then it was fine, but I've never had anything like jump into, into my head and rattle me around. That just has never happened. I think because I approach everything with a positive attitude, it makes a difference. Absolutely. And I, and I've heard a lot of people say that as well, that if you're expecting something negative to happen, you might attract that to you. And then other people say psychologically, eventually it's good to feel like they have that light around them and protecting them. Because I have heard people say that when they do dabble into astral projection, because sometimes I think people dabble into these psychic abilities because they're trying to explore. But I think we all need guidance depending on what we're doing. And sometimes people astral project into lower astral realms right and in that sense they're kind of leaving their body so I guess it depends on what you're doing there might be more exposure with certain things than others who knows but I've heard different arguments on on either side of 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 the fence so I I understand um I'm just looking at my questions just to make sure I I, because I had so many but you know I, I we can't be here for six hours so I'm just trying to see if there's any other thing that I think is worth talking about at the moment I think I I pretty much asked we pretty much talked about most of these things um Bertie we could go on and on and on forever (laughs) 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 and maybe I have to have you back again in the future for like a part three and and to dive a lot deeper but I've learned so much absolutely pertains to remote viewing love this conversation. This is one of my favorite conversations on this topic ever. I kid you not. This was a joy. Yes. I'm so happy that you enjoyed it. You know, on the podcast, I always have to ask if you shifted in perspective on anything recently, since the show is called Shifting Dimensions, it could be as deep or lighthearted as you want it to be. Okay. This one's going to go deep. So I was in, you know, I was hiding who I was for 22 years. That's a long time. And I started a UFO group. And when I started the UFO group, I knew there was a chance that people would find out who I was. And that is what happened just a few months ago. And everything in my life has changed in just a few months. I went from um, just being a beekeeper and then UFO organizer, community organizer to uh, training people. People are coming to my classes from literally all over the world. And now I'm doing operational work again, working with law enforcement to um, solve some mysteries. And it's like, I never left. It's amazing. I'm very excited about the future and excited to be back and engaged in this in a very present way and engaging with the public and being able to share all the things I worked on in secret for 22 years. It's huge. It's huge. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy that you found your way back into this space and you're feeling good about it and you're feeling excited. So I I hope that it just continues to grow and and reach the masses and reaches the right audiences, people who are interested in this work and want to learn. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, where can people find you and how can people, you know, train with you if they're interested in remote viewing? Yeah, you can find out all about my classes and I I have a free lecture series. Every few weeks I give a new lecture and so you can learn for free as well. Just follow my lectures along and my website is norivets.com, N-O-R-I-V-E-T-S.com, no rivets. And no rivets comes from, uh, actually comes from the Roswell UFO crash, one of the, uh, people that, that was, um, looking at the UFO examining the crash saucer said there were no seams, no rivets. <laughs> it was perfect. And I thought, Oh, no rivets because I would like to be perfect. So that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Birdie. I'm going to put the link uh, to that website in the show notes. Thank you for stopping by the show. I mean, this was an amazing conversation. I can't wait to go back and listen to it. And I'm sure, sure the audience enjoyed it as well. So I really appreciate your time. Ah, uh, thanks, Jimmy, so much. You are just mwah, such a joy, such a joy. I love your show so much. And you are a big part of the reason that I'm back in the field. So thank you. Yay, thank you.